Hello and welcome to the Book, Business, and Brand Building Summit. I'm your host, Jesse Krieger, joined today by a very special guest, uh, author of four books, national bestseller, The Art of Work, also somebody with a huge community of authors and writers, none other than Jeff Goins. Jeff, how are you doing? Welcome to the summit. Thanks, Jesse. Glad to be here. I'm doing great. Nice, and uh, you're you're calling in today from Nashville, Tennessee, right? Yeah, just outside of Nashville. I live in Franklin. Mm -hmm. And is this the uh, the writing studio where where the the magic happens in the books? <sighs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's my it's my office. Yeah, I have a uh, for years, uh, about ten years, I worked out of my home, uh, working for a nonprofit, and then you know working for myself, and then we started having kids, and we had a small house and. I was lucky enough to find some affordable office space about a mile from our house, and yeah, this is this is where I've been ever since. I haven't left. <laughs> I good. love all the books and the the typewriter in the background. And I should have held this up for the interview here oh, for cool. anybody that doesn't know the art of work. If nothing else, this summit has been a great opportunity to read mm. uh, a whole lot of new books. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, thank you for uh, for creating it. I'm still partway through it, but. Maybe as we as we jump in here, I feel like a lot of our audience will probably know who you are um, cool. to a certain degree, but I'd love to hear a little bit of your story in terms of, you know, you've said that you've written, you've been a writer most of your life, but only somewhat recently really identified and fully embraced that as, you know, sort of an identity and uh, and your professional vocation. So perhaps you can share a little bit about that process of fully embodying your your identity as a writer. Yeah, well, so there's a principle here, Jesse, that I believe, which is just that activity follows identity, that we become the things that we believe about ourselves. And certainly I'm not the first person to you know, talk about this, but uh, this impacted me, this idea impacted me when I was in my late 20s. I was working a good job. I was the uh, director of marketing at a nonprofit. And every year, my boss would give me a raise and give me more responsibility. And so this happened seven years in a row, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, as this happened, as I continued to advance in my career, I just kind of had this vision of, you know, 10, 15 years later, um, approaching, you know, more of the middle of my life and being well established in my career, you know, 15 plus years into it. And uh, you know, approaching a midlife crisis, thinking that if if this is where I am, not that it was a bad place, but it was a place where I realized I was comfortable. Is this if this is where I am in my mid to late forties or early fifties, I'm gonna feel like I settled. So there's stuff in me, there's work in me that I feel like needs to get out into the world, and that isn't happening in my current situation. I was not in one of those situations where hated my job or had a jerk boss or any of those things. I liked my uh, job. I loved working for a you know, uh, very smart and generous business leader, but I just felt like there was something more. And the more I thought about this, the more this itch became more and more unbearable and I realized I had to scratch it. So I started going to conferences and reading books and you know attending things like this, just trying to learn from other people who had been more successful than me and um, apply as much of it as I could. And around this time, you know, in the back of my mind, I had this thought that maybe I could be a writer. But this wasn't something that I envisioned ever since I was, you know, six years old or something, which I think is a, a myth. I think there are some people who at a very early age know that they're meant to do something, but I think most of us kind of feel like we're drifting through life and we're trying to make sense of it. And that's how I felt. And one of the people I had the opportunity to talk to was a guy named Stephen Pressfield, who is a best-selling author of The Legend of Bagger Vance, a number of uh, war novels, and wrote a great book for writers, creatives, and certainly entrepreneurs called The War of Art. And I got an opportunity to interview him, which was a tremendous uh, opportunity, and I asked him, when does a writer get to become a writer? When do you get to call yourself this thing? Because like it's not when you like graduate from college or uh, like you don't get a certificate. Like when do you get to become a writer? So you know, back of my mind, this is something I was thinking about doing, and he said, "You are when you say you are." Mm. And around that same time, I had a friend who asked me what my dream was, and I said, "I don't know what my dream is." And he said, "Really? Because I would have thought your dream was to be a writer." 
And I said, well, you know, like, like that hit me. You know, I've ever had a moment where somebody saw something in you that you were too afraid to admit yourself. Uh, but that was that moment for me. And I said, you know, I, I guess I'd like to be a writer someday. And he looked at me, he smiled and he said, Jeff, you don't have to want to be a writer. You are a writer. You just need to write. And I realized, you know, with, with uh, Stephen Pressfield and my, and my friend Paul telling me this, I realized that there was something in me that had to get out. But in order for it to get out, in order for me to do the work of a writer, and I was writing some on the side. It wasn't like just one day I woke up and I started writing. But I realized I needed to take this seriously. And that if I was going, going to be a writer, if I was going to write, I was going to have to start calling myself a writer. And I was going to have to start acting like it. And so it was this idea that activity follows identity. So Every morning you think I'm a loser or, you know, I'm, uh, I'm never going to get in shape or I'm never going to have the confidence that I need. We tend to live into the stories that we tell ourselves. So I decided to change the story and I, I started waking up every day and saying, I'm a writer. I wasn't a writer. I was a nonprofit marketer, but I started getting up at 5 a.m. And I said, well, right now I'm a writer. And what do writers do? Well, they get up and they write. And I did that for a year. And by the end of a year, I had a blog that had thousands of readers. I had a book publisher reach out to me. And I was on the path. I wasn't, I hadn't arrived at the destination yet, but I was on this two-year path that at the end of that process, I'd quit my job, launched what would become a million-dollar business, and uh, you know, started publishing books and really getting to live my dream. And I can point all of it back to that moment when I said, okay, I, I'm going to start acting. I'm a, I'm a writer, and I have to start acting like it. By the way, around that same time, I went to a conference, and I, I, people said, what, you know, like, what's your dream? And they said, write it down. You know what your dream is. You're just afraid to admit it. And I wrote it down and said, writer. All this stuff happened within like a month uh, of, of each other. And I went home and I had this notebook that I like wrote writer on. And I, I told my wife, I said, I'm a writer. I'm supposed to be a writer. I know what my dream is. And she looked at me and she said, are you kidding me? I've been telling you that for five years. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like if you pay attention and listen, maybe you can get there sooner. <laughs> it than sounds like in your case, I mean, there's a lot of gold in there. I mean, one, I, I get the impression that in your situation, like, similar that we're good is the enemy of the great, right? Mm, you, right? You weren't in a situation where like, I hate my job and I'm, I'll do anything I can to, to break free and start my own business, but right. like a groundswell of, uh, of desire that, you know, it sounds like you didn't even fully identify as with being a writer until that, that month and that conversation with Stephen Pressfield. And I think it's funny with the identity. It's something I think a lot about as well. And mm -hmm. oftentimes people can see externally, um, mm -hmm sometimes more clearly than we can even even envision it within ourselves. But yep, when, when those two, when those two paths connect, that's where I think the real magic happens. And, um, that probably also describes why you called your blog Goins writer. Would it, would it yeah. not be the case? That's absolutely right. And I, I, I got business cards and put it in my email signature and put it on my Facebook page, Jeff Goins comma writer. And it was really important to me that everywhere I went, uh, this wasn't like a branding tactic as much as it was just a reminder to me, like, dude, you are putting this out there. You cannot, like, this has to be true. Because if it's not true, you're in trouble because you're going to be a fake. And so, you know, sometimes people call this faking it till you make it. I think of it more as believing it till you become it, you know, really living into that story that you're telling yourself. And the truth is I'd written on and off for much of my life but I'd never taken it seriously. And Pressfield says that you turn pro first in your head before you ever do it on paper or out in the world. And, and like I said, the things that we believe about ourselves affect the things that we do. And I don't think that this has to be, you know, this doesn't be super woo or whatever if, if that freaks you out. Uh, I, I just think, um, you know, like if you put yourself out there, if you say, I do this thing, people go, okay, well, how's it going? And it's just great accountability. So I'd tell people at parties, they go, what, what, what do you do? I say, I'm a writer. Like it was, it was like the stupidest thing for me to say in the world. I'm a writer. Oh, really? What do you write? <laughs> and I was like, oh, I, have to, I, have, I need to have a better answer to this question than nothing. And so it forced me into the daily discipline of writing. And so, you know, I started saying, well, I write a blog and, and, here, and this is what it is. I hadn't written any books or done anything amazing. But I was writing, and for me, that was the definition of writer, somebody who gets up and does the work every day. Well, that, that actually touches on what my, my next question was going to be. It was around 
stating that identity publicly, saying it in conversation at yep. parties and when you yep. meet people, how impactful has that been for you in reinforcing the identity and creating a situation where you have self accountability? Like yep. you're out putting yourself out there as I'm Jeff Goins, comma, writer. Mm -hmm. And when you wake up in the morning, you're thinking, oh, do I want to sleep a little bit longer or you know, hang out with my family? Or do I get up and write? Does that help? Um, I think Stephen Pressfield also said, you know, like you're a professional when you do the work, even when you don't feel like it, even when you right. don't necessarily want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To that for people that are on the fence or not 100% in with their own commitment to be an author and an entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I have a very sort of blue collar, non snobby definition of writer. I remember. Uh, watching on Twitter one time an exchange between someone and Anne Lamott, who's a fantastic author, uh, wrote a book called Bird by Bird, which is great for anybody who aspires to write in, in any capacity. And somebody asked her, I mean, this was a best-selling book about writing, and so lots of people ask her, how do you become a writer? Somebody asked her that question, and she said, they, 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 she said, if you write, you're a writer. Now go get good. And, and I think there we we attach quality to an identity, right? Uh, the, you know, my, my, uh, my, my dad is my father and I am his son. Like I am his son because he had me. That doesn't make me a good kid. Like that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily make me an obedient child or like a good son. Uh, but like, because like I am this thing, uh, you know, like, it, it has no, I just am. There's no implication of quality. Uh, that's something that happens over time. So if you write, you're a writer. And maybe some people don't like that. I remember reading uh, another exchange on Twitter, which is where all good things and bad things happen. Uh, somebody said, you're not a writer until you've written and published three books. And I'm like, oh, really? Like, where's that rule? You know, where's that in the dictionary? Uh, you know, and, and, and by that uh, formula, Harper Lee, uh, author of To Kill a Mockingbird, one of the best-selling books in the past century, who really only published one book and then published another one at the very end of her life, uh, she doesn't count. She's yeah, not she's a writer. She's trying to become an author, you know, later <laughs> in life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe posthumously, 100 years from now, they'll discover another unknown book from her, and then she gets to call herself an author. No, that's ridiculous. Like, it's just an identity. It's just a job. And if you do it, like, you get to call yourself it. Um, you know, if you practice law, if you practice law, you're a lawyer. Um, and I don't think you get to call yourself a lawyer if you pass the bar exam once and you're not practicing law. If you practice writing, I mean seriously, not just writing emails and tweets or whatever, then you're a writer. And all we're talking about here, Jesse, is integrity. People misunderstand that term. We think that that's about being nice or good or honorable. You talked about it earlier. Integrity just means whatever inside, whatever internal matches the external. And sometimes there's stuff in us that we're afraid to tap into. And like you said, it's oozing out of us and we don't even realize it. And people see. And the truth behind that is that there is no internal and external you. It's all you. It's integrated. But when we live disintegrated lives, uh, we feel literally like we're, we're pulled into, like we're falling apart. And so when I started calling myself a writer, that was just integrating my true self, the thing in me that wanted to come out, not to get too esoteric, but I just realized like this was the thing that I wanted to do, at least in this season of life. And when I started doing it and, and boldly claiming it in spite of having any accolades or awards or anything, I didn't have any of that stuff. Um, uh, it, it, it was just bringing these two things that were separate into the same place. It was, it felt nice. It felt peaceful. And I would, I would guess that most people don't like have a clear idea of the thing that they're meant to do with their life tomorrow, but there's some something in your life that feels a little bit off, an itch that you need to scratch. Maybe you've succeeded at the wrong thing. Maybe you've continued to fail at this thing that you know just needs to work, but there's a little bit of disintegration. And I would submit, you know, a little bit humbly because I don't know everybody's situation, I would submit that the first step in kind of bringing those two pieces together is to start with the things that you say about yourself. I don't, I don't think using words like wannabe and aspiring are helpful. Claim it and then start living into it. <clears throat> this is so juicy. I mean, you're using some of my, my all-time favorite terms like integrity. <laughs>
living into the story. Yeah. I always said, you know, if you tell yourself a better story, you get a better ending. Yeah, love that. <laughs> and uh, and I think you, I just want to underscore a point you made about the language that we use with our own self-talk. I think oftentimes, you know, we're our own harshest critics. And, you know, if you're using language that's future tense oriented, you know, one day I'll write a book or I want to be an X, Y, Z, then it doesn't ground itself in the present and, and become a daily practice that reinforces that identity. I think you really touched on it in, in, with the word integrity of like what you feel and what you believe internally is also reflected back mm -hmm. by the people in your lives and those that you engage with professionally. Yeah. Um, and I guess not to belabor the point, but is there is there anything else you want to add from your own experience about living into that identity? Because it's something I guess I've experienced so many times if I'm entering a new field or a new passion, you know, at first, it can seem or feel very clear internally. But then there's a process of doing the work to the point where enough external uh, things have been created, brand, products, whatever it may be, that somebody can look and be like, oh, that person clearly does this. Mm -hmm. And it, it can be incremental, um, but it can also be 100% clear internally. So I guess any final points on you know identity as it relates to writership and, and being an author? Yeah, great question. Uh, just to go back to something that you said earlier, which is like when you get up every morning and you say, I'm a writer, does that affect the things that you do? And I think it helped me get started. Uh, but more recently, you know, I mentioned million dollar business and some of the, the successes that I've had recently. Uh, I realized that there was starting to, ha like this disintegration was starting to happen again, where the things that were making me money and successful and famous, you know, internet famous, <laughs> uh, that, that were giving me the things that I thought were what I wanted were actually pulling me away from the core identity, which is I'm a writer and, and my job here is to um, uh, share ideas with the world that can impact culture in a positive way. Like that to me is, is my mission. Everything else that I do, marketing, business, whatever, it really is supposed to support that. Uh, but it's quite common, I think, for somebody to get good at something and and then to, you know, find ways to sort of maximize the value that they offer doing that something. And before you know it, the the responsibilities and expectations and obligations um, that that thing, uh, you know, uh, awarded you are now the very things that are pulling you away from your craft, from the thing that got you there in the first place. And I had a an awakening, you know, wake up call at the end of last year, my best year ever in the past four years of being in business for myself. And I realized, whoa, this was my best year ever. And if I keep going in this direction, I, I'm back where I was, you know, several years ago, which is I'm succeeding at the wrong thing. I'm not miserable, but I'm comfortable and, and I'm headed somewhere that I, that uh, part of me, a very egotistical, like, uh, selfish, ambitious me who just wants to be successful. And there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, like that's that's where that part of me wants to be. But I could feel that that drive pulling me away from who I really am. And, and it was just a reminder. And again, this isn't about being a martyr. Like I feel like I, I can be just as if not more successful focusing on the writer thing. But I realized that success creates all kinds of opportunities that if you aren't clear on who you are and what you're supposed to do in this world, um, you know, you're going to be pulled in a million different directions. And so it's it's been a true north for me, like even recently. What do I say yes to? What do I say no to? Even saying yes to this, which is, you know, typically I'm saying no to a lot of these things, kind of went through that filter. And I think your brand follows your identity, but you have to be careful that your brand doesn't become a representation of somebody that you actually aren't are. When you have a personal brand, I mean, that's, that's a real... Um, issue and and when that happens, I think you kind of have to you know reintegrate things. Well, I, I, that makes me doubly thankful to to have you on as a guest. And you know, I think you really said something important there about you know success breeds opportunity. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of times, like staying on that path that feels true becomes a process of saying no and being more um, discerning in what you actually undertake and say yes to. It's. Uh, it's kind of a double-edged sword in, in some senses. And uh, I can think of a number of parallels, you know, with my own experience. Mm -hmm. um, very good. Well, so how did this journey from, you know, really deciding 
that you're going to embody and, and pursue writing as, as a vocation, as an identity, begin to turn into um, creating books. I mean, now you have four books, so you're technically an author. <laughs> <laughs> Finally made it. <laughs> yeah. So where did that, uh, how did that bridge from just engaging in the practice of writing and starting to turn into, you know, the books such as, uh, such as The Art yeah. of Work and, and your others? It started with a daily practice, Jesse, and for me that was a minimum of 500 words a day. In fact, I created this free community online called my500words.com, and you can go there and just sign up for 31 days of, of writing prompts uh, because I realized that if you can do this for a month, if you can just get up and write 500 words a day, which for me takes about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, if you do that, I mean, you really are becoming a writer. And um, you do that, this is how I write basically every book. You do that for three, four, five, six months, and by the end of it, you've got a manuscript that then you can edit. I'm not saying it's a you know final draft or anything. Uh, contrasted with something like NaNoWriMo, where you know millions of people go all in on this and you know a fraction of them actually end up completing their novels in a month. If you pace yourself, if you just write 500 words a day and you do it day after day after day, month after month, um, you're going to build a great habit that allows you to practice and prepare for um, you know writing other long form stuff. So um, I just started with with that habit and I published it on my blog because if I didn't have a deadline, I wasn't going to do it. I was going to put it off. So I had a daily deadline where I published a new article on my blog about 500 words every single day for a year. And I did that and and uh, by the end of the year, I, and it sounds like a lot, and I guess it. It was a lot, but it wasn't a lot all at once. It was 500 words a day, every single day. Um, before my wife got up, I'd write for, you know, I'd wake up before her, I'd write for 30 minutes, she'd wake up, we'd have breakfast, she'd go to work, I'd go to work. You know, uh, halfway into that, we ended up having a baby. I mean, we had stuff going on, but I would just set aside, you know, 30 minutes every day to write, which I know some people go, I don't have 30 minutes. I totally get that. They're busy seasons and slower seasons. But I know a novelist, I know somebody who's published a couple of books with Penguin, the largest publisher in the world. And she's a mom, a uh, teacher, has a side business, very busy. And she, uh, on some days, only gets to write for 10 minutes a day. But she, she never misses a day because just the practice is so important. And I think of it like fitness or something. Just do a little bit every day and and... Once you get to the gym, once you put the running shoes on, you know, you do it for five or ten minutes, you go, well, I'm out here, and I actually have a few more minutes. I'll do a little bit more. Same thing's true with writing, any habit. You just want to build the habit, and then you can kind of increase it as you go. So I did that for a year. I, I love that. And, it, you know, you're right. On the one hand, it sounds like a lot, like every day for a year. Yeah. But on the other hand, really, 20 to 30 minutes for one year to set yourself up very firmly in a new identity a new vocation and have an actual body of work that mm -hmm. you've been creating I think the momentum that's built the inertia yeah. is is an important point I'd love yeah. to have you speak to it's like I heard one of the best fitness trainers um, for Olympic athletes and all of this say I don't ask my athletes to make the commitment to become the gold medal champion at the Olympics I ask them to make the commitment to sit down and put on their left shoe because if you sit down and put on your left shoe, what's the next thing you do? You put on your right shoe, mm -hmm. then you get up, and then you go outside, and then you start, and then you're in the flow of activity, and across that threshold that spans inaction to action, mm -hmm. is there a lever like that that you use to just ensure that you stay consistent with that practice or get into the space where you actually begin the writing process? I think that's what may trip a lot of people up is the actual – you know, getting into the physical space, getting in the mental space where they begin. Once you begin, it ends up being fun, mm -hmm. but that can seem like the big scary monster. Yeah, you know, there's this saying that I disagree with, which is that uh, I hate writing, I love having written. And I like to run, I go running, and I, I don't think I don't think it's sustainable to pick a habit, an exercise routine, whatever, that you hate while you're doing it. You know, most people I talked to, I, I think I even read Richard Branson talking about this, and, you know, he always says that health has been really important to his entrepreneurial success. 
Um, pick something that you enjoy, tennis, golf, swim, whatever, like do move around and do something that you like while you're doing it. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt, you know, pushing that last mile or putting in that last rep. I mean, we understand that if we do this enough that the pain, the discomfort that we feel is often what leads to growth. But showing up, doing it, uh, that should be fun. And so, you know, if you don't love writing and you don't want to do it, like pick something else, you know, like do a YouTube video a day or a podcast or something. For me, writing was, you know, that important and it was that fun. And, and like you said, once I started doing it, I really did enjoy it. And so it was really about putting myself in a place where something would happen that would trigger this thing, that would trigger this thing, that would trigger this thing, and then I'm writing. And uh, once you start doing it for a month or a few months, it, it kind of becomes effortless. Not easy, but effortless. And what I mean by that is you don't have to think about it as much anymore. And so, uh, yeah, so how do you do that? Well, I think um, get getting up or staying up. I mean, I realize some people are night riders and some people you know, may do it in, in the early morning. Uh, but finding a time in your schedule that is, is not likely to get interrupted by another activity. So your lunch break, Maybe, maybe not, you know, like don't put yourself in a place where you're likely to get interrupted. For me, that was 5, 6 a.m. in a house where my wife did was was not very just, she's not a morning person. So even if she did get up, she's like, leave her alone for the first hour. So it was a quiet time. I wasn't getting a lot of emails or phone calls at 5 a.m. So pick a time that is, um, is not going to have a lot of interruptions. Find a place that's not going to have a lot of interruptions. Uh, for me, that meant going someplace where I didn't have Wi-Fi because that was a distraction. Uh, and you know, sometimes you have more control over this than than not. So it's not about having sort of a perfect plan, but just put yourself in a place where you're not going to get interrupted at a time when you're not going to get interrupted, and um, and then just get to it. Now, there's a, a a way in which I do this that helps you beat what Stephen Pressfield calls resistance, which is that when most people sit down to write, they go, what am I going to write about? I wouldn't even know what to write. Even if I had 30 minutes, it would take me 25 to figure out what I'm going to write. So my process, Jesse, is the day before, I'm going for a walk or driving home from work or whatever, and I get an idea. We all get ideas in the shower while getting dressed, lying in bed at night or whatever. I get an idea and I just write it down. I pull out my phone or you pull out a notebook and I write it down. And for me, I save it in Evernote, which automatically syncs with the uh, app from my phone to my computer, and the next day, I get up and I open it. And I actually have a folder filled with these ideas, just random little words and lines, but they're triggers. They're prompts that get me writing. So I get up at the same time. I go to the same place because there's something about that spatial memory when you sit down in the same place that you sit down every day to, to only write. This is like this is all you do in this place at this time is you write. Your brain goes, oh, we're writing now. Let's get to work, and then I don't have to think. I'm trying to not think and just write because I have limited time, and I go, oh, this is what I'm going to do. It's kind of like working out, and I, I, I keep pointing it back to that because these are both things that I'm not great at. I'm not great at writing. I'm not great at working out, but I realize if I put myself in the place, I usually feel better about myself um, when I'm doing it and uh, afterwards, and so I, I am terrible at going to the gym or whatever. And just Like, what am I going to do? But if I have a plan and I go, well, today's legs, I don't really want to do, nobody ever wants to do legs, but if today's the day that I do that and I don't have to think about it and I just get to work, okay. And that's why I always have those prompts ready to go so I can just start writing. I love that. And I, I would definitely agree that there's a strong analogy to be used with fitness. I mean, mm -hmm. even in the same sense of like, if you're not exercising and you finally commit to start, the yep. first week or two, you're going to be sore. Yep. And you might not really enjoy it. But yeah. when you get over that initial hump, yeah. you know, it's been the case for me too. I literally don't think about it. And yeah. I think that's an important thing. Yeah. I know the, you know, three or four different exercise regimens and I literally wake up, stretch, put on my stuff, go. There's no actual thought going into it, which may sound counterintuitive to everybody watching this, but take take what Jeff is saying to heart that if you can find a way to maybe psych yourself out from even thinking about it, getting an idea beforehand, mm -hmm. getting into a routine or having a yeah. set place where when you're there, you begin to adapt into the mindset of now we're doing this, now we're writing. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that helps it flow much yeah. more easily. Yeah, so the idea of like, I would never say commit to writing every day for a year. That's a terrible idea. <laughs> I would say uh, commit to writing tomorrow. 
you know, and sit down and put in 500 words. And then once you've done that, do it again the next day. Uh, Seinfeld has a technique for this uh, called, um, uh, what is it called? Like, just don't break the chain. You start a habit and you just, you get a calendar and you go, okay, I'm going to do this tomorrow. And you put an X when you do, do it. You go, okay, that wasn't so bad. I'll do it again tomorrow. Put an X. And, and the idea is once you get something going, it's easier to keep it going than it is to stop it. And there's the guilt, right, of, oh, I got to start all over again. And once you get it going, you know, you write for a week and then a month and then a few months, it's actually kind of harder to stop. You mentioned momentum. It's harder to stop than it is to just keep going. It's like I don't really consciously choose to get dressed or brush my teeth. Or, like these are things that I do every day. I don't really think about them. It would be harder to stop doing those. It would be harder to like stay in my pajamas all day because I do this every day and that would be weird to stop. Maybe a little bit enjoyable once in a while. You know, but like it would be weird to stop. And that's what you want to do. You want to do this so often, so frequently. It doesn't have to be a lot. I used to think it was all about quantity. So I'd write for three, four hours on a random Saturday afternoon. But that's sort of this like binge and purge approach you know <laughs> all my friends who understand the body better than i do and talk about physical training you know like what is working out three hours every three weeks do for you uh just hurts it just yeah, hurts exactly <laughs> it just hurts <laughs> yeah and uh, i mean you just want to do this thing so frequently that it becomes second nature that not doing it seems ridiculous yeah the, the analogy i've i've used and i think it's appropriate is like you know a freight train when it's just starting to move requires yeah. a huge amount of energy yeah. and you could just put a two by four on the track and stop yeah. a massive freight train. But if it's going 50, 60, 70 miles an hour, you could smash through a brick wall and not yeah. miss a beat. Wow. And, um, and I, I think that's just what came to mind as you were yeah. talking about building momentum, building inertia. Yep. Yep. And so I'd love to, I'd love to dive into a little bit about how your, your writing or what started as a blog turned into now four books and yeah, what was that process like and you know do you experience anything uh, different from how you think of yourself as a writer versus an author author in this case being defined as someone who has a book that you can totally. hold up and say here's my book yeah yeah so there was this really beautiful byproduct and this is why I'm such a big fan of blogging now with blogging you're not just practicing you're practicing in public. You're putting your work out there. It'd be like if you wanted to play music, as both you and I have done professionally at certain points, uh, and you go, okay, we want to be in a band and we want to book shows, and we're just going to like go in our garage and just rock out and play every single day forever and hope somebody discovers us. And uh, two things are going to happen if you do that. One, you're not going to get booked unless like a producer is walking down the street or something. Uh, and two, you're actually not going to get that good. You are going to get your best. You are going to push yourself in your skill uh, when you put yourself out there, when you perform for an audience. I think this is true with speaking. This is true with music. This is true with writing. When you put your work out into the world and you risk rejection, uh, you are like you're going to have to bring your A game because that's scary. And uh, I remember the day when I started uh, playing shows as a teenager. I played guitar and I, for years I played guitar in my basement for myself. Or, you know, I wouldn't even jam with people. Then I started jamming with friends and I got a little bit better. And then we started booking shows and we were a band. And when we started rehearsing for those live shows, I realized that when we hit a wrong chord or sang a wrong note, we couldn't stop. Even in the rehearsal, we couldn't stop and go back and start over again because we knew we wouldn't have that luxury playing for a live audience. And so it made us figure it out. Well, what happens? When, I don't We keep going and we get better and we try to avoid those, those moments because they're uncomfortable. And so when I was blogging, writing a new blog post on my blog every day for a year, uh, I was building an audience. Uh, at first, kind of accidentally, and then when I started seeing people show up and comment, I started being more intentional about it. I started writing on other people's blogs guest posting. I tried to, I started learning about internet marketing and how you can, uh, you know, get people to your website and have them sign up for, you know, a free ebook or something. And I just started to understand how this works. And so by the end of the year, I had 10,000 people on my email list. And I, I literally had a publisher email me and say, um, Hey, have you ever thought about publishing a book? And I was like, what? And so I got an agent and I got a book deal and I started, I started writing books, and then I, I, uh, I actually needed money, and so I self-published a book in the same year that I had a traditionally published book come out, 
And then I turned that book, that book did really well. Uh, I turned that into an online course, uh, built a business teaching writers around that. So I was writing books and learning what it took to become a writer. And then I was turning around and teaching what I was learning. Uh, and th those two things, writing books and teaching writing, just kind of kept going and have been going ever since for the past several years. And it's, I love that. And do you find that, you know, that playing on both sides of the, the looking glass, perhaps, you know, mm -hmm. having your own book and having it out there and then turning around and having a writing course where you're engaging with other yeah. people accomplishes the same effect as like, you know, a band that's performing live on a stage where you're operating in a public eye or under the, you know, the scrutiny or with the attention of other yeah. people up leveling your yeah. own game. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I I always find it interesting when you meet a coach or a consultant or a you know business speaker, and like they're talking about business from lessons that they learned twenty years ago, and now they're just sort of a professional advice giver, you know. And on one hand, I get it, right? Like the world's best coaches aren't active athletes; they were typically athletes at one point in their lives. Typically, not the best athletes, but they were. I mean, they were. You know, they were. They understood the craft, but they were much better coaches than they ever were star athletes. If they were stars, they would have just kept playing the game. And so I get it. Like I get that coaching is a whole other thing. It's a whole other uh, skill set. But I think in general, uh, for me and what I do, it's very important to my audience, to my customers and clients that I'm doing the stuff that I'm talking about. And it works now in an industry where five or 10 years is a lot, especially with you know, where publishing is at and what the internet and Amazon are doing to the world of books. So it's important that I have a proven track record of success for myself, you know, writing books that are not about writing or about the things that I'm, I'm teaching, just are about completely separate topics. And then I can turn around to my audience and with integrity say, this is how you do it. This is how I've done it. And this is how I've studied and in seeing many other people replicate this process. All of a sudden, I feel like you've got a principle that you can turn around and teach. And I mean, let's be honest, we live in the age of professional advice givers where anybody, I mean, look at what we're doing here. Anybody with a laptop can do this and people can show up and listen to them and pay them for you know their brain. Uh, but what I love about what you're doing, Jesse, is you've been there and you've done it again and again and again and you know what you're talking about which is why I'm I'm here there's a lot of fakers out there and and I think you have to be careful who you listen to you need to pay attention to people who have actually done the stuff that they talk about over and over and over again and then they've actually helped other people replicate their success then I think you can listen to them yeah I think that that is that advice is so on point and you know, it's something that <clears throat> means a great deal to me personally as well. I mean, sure, we're here doing this summit, but my core business is a publisher. And that's why mm -hmm. I put these on the wall so I can just see them all the time and be constantly reminded of that. And, you know, I've always found the people I like learning from are, you know, a year, two years, maybe three or four ahead of me in terms of where I want to go on the same path and trajectory I'm on. And at the same time, the people that I help and can be of most value to are maybe a year or two behind where I'm at and that spectrum seems to be a good model that uh, that I think about in terms of who I would invite onto this summit for example people that I want to learn from and are further along on the path that you know I and the audience here um, wants to pursue just the same as when I'm working with authors or working with clients you know they want to get to a place where I'm sort of at now and that feels in integrity um, in terms of putting oneself out there as a coach, a consultant, an advisor, as opposed to just like getting on your soapbox, opening your laptop and being like, hey, I'm an expert, you know, which mm -hmm. it's hard to really point a finger and say like, who's actually doing that? But it seems like there is so much noise out there and I just try and sidestep that completely. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think it helps to point fingers or name names, but I what I look for, because I think what you typically see, Jesse, and, and I like, so my friends are doing this and I love them, but I go, look, like you haven't really proven yourself yet. And I think we just have to be very careful and skeptical. And sometimes people sort of fake their way into becoming coaches and advice givers and it works and that's fine. I, I try to be very careful with that and also never over promise something saying, here's what I've done. It's not this, it's this. And if you want to do this, I can help you. I know, I know how to do that. Um, but I think what we tend to see is somebody has one success 
one lucky break, one one best selling book, and now they're going to go tell people how to be you know best selling authors or whatever. And I think you have to have a proven track record, you know. So uh, you know the 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 twenty one year old kid who you know turns his life around in a year and has a bunch of success and then tells other people how to <laughs> how to do the same thing. Like that's cool. But I like I think we should be a little bit skeptical of that. Doesn't mean we can't learn something from anybody. I'm I'm a big fan of that. Um, but I, I think more often than not, there are these hidden gems of people who have decades of experience of success who are just waiting to be asked. I call this in my book, The Art of Work, I call this an accidental apprenticeship. And it's this idea that you can become a student of lots of people who are successful at different things around you if you just have eyes to see the teachers around you. And a lot of these are not the, the big, loud, you know, marketers, uh, t which I would like identify with, you know, like I'm one of those people. Um, they're not like big, loud, noisy people. They're um, these people that are in your life already that are just waiting to be asked. And again, I think we can learn from everybody. Uh, but just because somebody's super noisy and calls themselves an expert doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do what they say. Yeah. Well, I want to, I mean, that's that's definitely solid advice. I guess I want to shift gears just a little, and sure. then we'll begin to to bring this uh, conversation full circle and, and to a close. But you know, I know there's a lot of people here on the summit that are weighing, you know, do I go the self-publishing route or do I pursue, yeah. um, or if I'm if there's any interest, do I engage with? A publisher, I'd love for you to speak to your uh, experience, Jeff, about you know playing on both sides of that uh, of that line. Yeah, well, my answer to this question is always yes. Do I self-publish or traditionally publish? And the answer is yes. And what I mean by that is put your work out into the world. And and, and what I find, Jesse, and I don't know if you you experience the same thing or not, but when somebody goes, "Do I self-publish or do I traditionally publish?" I go, "How many books have you published?" Well, none. And how long have you been thinking about this? Two years. And and is your book written? No. Okay, like these are not like the right questions to be asking. Not to, and I'll answer the question in a second, but I think that a lot of people get tripped up here. Uh, I have a friend, Anthony Ongaro, who says he has this brilliant idea. It's called the, the false first step. The false first step. We go, well, I really want to write a book, but I, I'm getting hung up on whether I should self-publish or traditionally publish. You need to work on your book, <laughs> you know? Like that you need to commit to publishing period. And if you don't have a bunch of traditional publishers knocking on your door, um, like then you ha then you you have no options. You need That's to a false choice, right? Yeah, right. You don't have a choice and that's okay. A lot of people don't. Um, I've done both and I would encourage somebody who wants to write more than one book in their lifetime to do both, to try both because there are pros and cons. I'm happy to lay those out, but beware the false first step. You know, like the false first step to getting healthy is I'm going to buy a gym membership. That is not your first step. Your first step is literally to take 20 steps around the block, you know, and then to do it again tomorrow. And then maybe, you, you know, get a gym membership after doing that for a week. So don't do the false first step. Pick the, 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 the first true step, which is I need to write a book and I need to start practicing every day. And then I need to build an audience because whether or not I self-publish or traditionally publish, I need to be able to reach the readers that this book is for and not trust a publisher to just take care of me. I'm still going to have to do the work. Uh, so, you know, because somebody has to like, you know, say that something other than it's complicated and, you know, it depends on what you want. I, the pros and cons for me are pretty simple. The pros of working with a publisher are in general, they're going to help me reach more people. The con is they're going to keep a higher percentage of royalties, uh, you know, but I, if I can negotiate a big enough advance, which at this point in my career I'm able to do, um, the money that I get up front, you know, kind of outweighs the the risk of publishing it myself and then having to collect royalties over time. I can make more money up front, they do more work, and then it's out there in the world reaching more people. The number one success metric for me in writing books and publishing them is um, books sold, number of copies sold. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I have a business that I make enough income off of that supports me, that the books for me are kind of one part lead gen, lead generation for my business, and another part impact. It's, it's, it's a brand builder. And uh, this is something that I think you hear you know, a lot of business authors talk a lot about. Your, your book is a business card, et cetera. Um, I just, you know, like I want to write great books and I want, and I believe in the impact that books have on people. And I just want, I would rather have more people buy my books 
and me make roughly the same amount of money than I would to sell fewer copies and you know maybe make a little bit more you know self publishing and so right now for me because I've done both the trade off is uh, sell fewer copies make a little bit more money or sell a lot more copies and make a smaller percentage of royalties but at the end of the day make about the same amount of money uh, so it's not about money it's about impact for me uh, the benefits of self publishing are um, you get to turn around the product faster you can get it out there sooner distribution is not impossible but it's more difficult to get into things like big box stores airports uh, uh, brick and mortar bookstores things like that um, if you don't go through the whole process the um, uh, the final product can be kind of a, a lower quality although I think there's there's as a self-published author you can you know you can make it just as good as a traditionally published title if you put the work and money into it but the con is you have to put all the money up front and then you know if you don't have um, you know a few thousand dollars which is what Guy Kawasaki says it takes uh, to self-publish a really nice looking book guy wrote a book called ape author publish entrepreneur which is a great sort of just guide to self-publishing he says it takes about three thousand dollars to publish a you know self-publish a really great book now my, my uh, one of my very first books you are a writer so start acting like one was an ebook that I self-published for free I wrote it I had a friend volunteer her editing services in exchange for, hey, if this book does anything, like I'll, I'll link to your website in my book and people can go find you. Did the same thing with the designer, put it out there. I made $50,000 in a year off of it. Uh, so you can bootstrap it. You can figure out ways to do it. I think at the end of the day, if it's about you want more control and, and you ultimately you know, would like to make more money per book, self-publishing is a great route to go. Um, if you uh, if you have an opportunity to work with a traditional publisher or you have a big idea and you want it just out there into the world distributed through some you know bigger better larger channels uh, it may be wor worth looking into working with a traditional publisher for most people their only option is going to be to self publish I am a big fan of that being one of your first steps in what is hopefully a long publishing career because this stigma that used to exist that once you self-publish you can't traditionally publish is gone I had a friend launch a, uh, a self-published book and in two months he made forty thousand dollars he had publishers knocking on his door saying can we publish your next book can we give you a lot of money yeah because he proved it he proved that he could do it and that's all publishers care about can you sell books notice that regardless of what you do I did not say anything about marketing because no matter what you do, that is your responsibility. I love that, and I, I you, you, you made my point for me. I was just going <laughs> to draw a line under that and be like, everything that you just said, Jeff, is whether you go traditional, whether you go self-publishing. In either case, you're a hundred percent responsible. I would say maybe yeah. it's not a hundred percent, but assume a hundred percent responsibility yeah. for your marketing as an author, and you won't be disillusioned. And I want to make another point too: is like you know, for my for my book, Lifestyle Entrepreneur, I wrote the whole book self-published it was under a different name and then ultimately got into conversations with publishers and worked with two different publishers before I saw an opportunity of how to do publishing in a different way but now I have a, a partnership with Morgan James publishing who published yeah. my book in the US I love those guys. and well, I guess just to make just to make your point that book sales is the metric you know yeah. if I am going to try and matriculate one of my authors up to national distribution through Morgan James I'll get on the phone with uh, David Hancock, who runs it, yeah. and the first thing he'll say, tell me the ISBN number. And yeah. he'll look it up, <laughs> say, okay, so here's how many books it sold. Yeah. And it, that's the conversation, because yeah. publishing traditionally is a business, right? Yeah. So it's not about, ooh, tell me about your story, or what's that author's unique <laughs> angle in the market? It's, let me get the ISBN number, and let me take a look on Bookskin. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. we go into the conversation from there. Yeah. So I guess if you're watching, and you're on this fence or you're potentially making the false choice of, you know, I'm gonna hold out for a traditional publisher versus published, take Jeff's words to heart and just go. The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the more sales you drive as a self-published author will result in yep. inbound interest of people saying, hey, do you wanna explore the possibility of publishing? Yep. And yeah, that's you know, a good position to be in, right? Absolutely. Uh, I had a friend, I have a friend uh, who published uh, two ebooks, self published two ebooks on his own, sold, I don't know, uh, something like 30, 40,000 copies of those books 
which is really great, and had one of the big five publishers, one of the big New York publishers, reach out to him and say, hey, we'd love to you know, sign you and paid him $300,000 for a two book contract. And uh, that was life changing money for him. And he started out as a self published author, just publishing ebooks, you know, uh, Kindle books. And how did he do it? Well, he built a very large audience, serving his audience through a blog, found out what resonated with them, what didn't, self published, and then got the attention of a major book publisher. More often than not, I see that path happening again and again and again. And the end is not necessarily that you work with a traditional publisher at all. I mean, there are big name authors who are selling millions of copies of their books. Hugh Howey, a fiction author, writes science fiction uh, novels comes to mind. And he is a uh, self-published uh, author selling millions of copies and has had all kinds of big New York publishers knocking on his door. And he says, no, thanks, I'm good. So the point is just you need to do what's best for you and your brand and the books that you want to write. And, um, but it is 100%, I agree, your responsibility uh, for who's going to sell these books, who's going to find the audience, and who's going to get them to say, that message is for me. Yeah, yeah. So not looking at a publisher as the gateway to exposure to a new audience, but rather proactively building, engaging with that audience. And then right. you're in the best situation you can be in regardless of your publishing status. Yep. I agree. Jeff, this has been a, f a fascinating and mm -hmm. just inspiring conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the Book Business Brand Building Summit. And maybe you can take us home with any final words of wisdom for the author, author, entrepreneurs out there. And uh, feel free to shout out to you know where people can engage with you, learn more about you, and uh, and come into your world. Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Jesse. I love this. Um, this was this has been a blast, and, and glad to be a part of it. Uh, but no, I just want to underscore, you know, what you uh, what we already said, which is I think that a lot of aspiring authors are waiting for some big break. They're waiting for something to happen, and I think the truth is uh, there never really was a big break. There was a bunch of little tiny actions that over time led to these waves of momentum. You know, and you see people who have momentum in, in their lives and you go, that must be nice. And I think, uh, sure, some people get lucky and some people maybe are born with it or whatever, but most people, um, what we see is the result of years, sometimes decades of work. And once you get that train moving, it looks like it, looks like it was always moving that fast and what could get in the way of it and that must be nice. Uh, but behind every success story I've ever found, I'm sure you've experienced this too, Jesse, where you meet high level performers, you know, top level people. And there's always this discipline of practice and perseverance and just putting in the work and over time it adds up. It was what I heard living in, in Nashville in relation to music industry. You'd always hear overnight success, seven <laughs> years in the making. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's funny. So yeah, I, I, one thing I'd love to share with your audience for those who are interested in this is just a free ebook that I have. Because you know, somebody's going, well, how do I do this? I think the most important next step uh, is to build an audience. If you don't have an email list of at least 1,000 subscribers, that's the first place to start, I think. And once I had that audience, publishers were knocking on my door. I was able to self-publish and and sell 10,000 copies of a self-published book and make $50,000 in a year, which was life-changing money for my family and me. Um, so it, there's a lot of things that are made possible when you have an audience, and there are a lot of things that are much harder as a brand, as a business, and certainly as an author um, when you don't have that built-in audience. And so I have a free ebook that I'd love to share with, with those listening. And if you just go to my blog, Goins Writer, G-O-I-N-S, writer.com slash audience, just slash audience, you'll get a free guide to building um, a, a large audience. I share everything that I did in 18 months to build an audience of, of over 100,000 people. And if you put all that stuff in practice and just get 1,000 email subscribers, you're you're on your way. Absolutely. Thanks so much. So that's goinswriter.com slash audience. We'll link that up. Thank you'll you. be able to click on it beneath this video. And Jeff, thanks so much again. Uh, really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for joining us on the Book Business Brand Building Summit. I hope you are getting a ton of value from this experience. Um, and we'll see you on a future interview. See you soon. Bye for now.